This is the next lesson for the Bible Institute, and we made it to the millennium. We just talked about the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation. And we talked a little bit about the second coming that takes place after the tribulation, where the Lord comes down with us on white horses to bring in the kingdom. This will be the millennial kingdom. Now, millennium is a combination of two words. Milli, meaning 1,000, and annum, meaning year. And the millennium is where the Lord gives Israel the land that was promised to them. In the millennium is where you will rule over cities if you suffered with the Lord during your time on this earth and your physical body. If you suffer with the Lord, you're going to rule over cities during that future time. And the millennium puts an end to the times of the Gentiles. The Antichrist and his false kingdom is wiped out. And the Lord will physically reign on the throne in Jerusalem. Now a key verse, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. It says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The 1,000 year reign is the day of the Lord. His wrath and vengeance and the tribulation and second coming kicks the day off. And the 1,000 year reign is the day of the Lord. The millennium is what Abraham was looking for. In Hebrews 11, 9 through 10, it says, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He looked for a city. So the millennium is what Abraham was looking for. And John 8, 56 says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So he was looking for the day of the Lord. The Old Testament prophets did not see the church age. They prophesied about the first coming and didn't even know all the details about it. But they were looking for him to show up with a crown and not a cross. They prophesied about the millennium, but they saw over the church age. They were looking for a king and a kingdom. It says in 1 Peter 1.11, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. You see, they prophesied about the first coming, and it was prophesied about Jesus Christ died on the cross, but they didn't understand it. What they saw was a king and a kingdom. That's what they were looking for. In Revelation 20, it makes it so clear that you are dealing with a period of 1,000 years in this future millennial kingdom. In Revelation 20, you've got the greatest chapter showing you a future 1,000-year reign. It says in Revelation 20 and verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So imagine being the angel that gets the privilege of binding the devil in the bottomless pit. A lot of guys say this is Michael the archangel. And that makes sense seeing as how he had already kicked the devil out of the second heaven in Revelation chapter 12. So this makes sense that he gets to be the angel that grabs a hold of him to put him in the bottomless pit. And this chain that he's got here, this couldn't be any regular chain. The maniac in the gospels couldn't be bound with fetters and chains. This has got to be a supernatural chain here. Just like how the angels are said to be in chains of darkness. In Jude verse 6 it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So these had to be some type of supernatural chains in order to bind the devil. In Revelation 20 and verse 2 it says, And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So notice how this shows you that when the Bible talks about the dragon, the serpent, and the devil, and Satan, it's all the same master villain. 
and he's bound 1,000 years. Notice that. A thousand years. He's bound for a thousand years. This is another way you know that the millennium hasn't already taken place yet or is taking place right now. Look around. The devil's not bound. He's roaming free. And this is why evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is why he presently worketh in the children of disobedience, as it talks about in Ephesians 2 and verse 2. He can't presently work in the children of disobedience if he's bound in the bottomless pit. Revelation 20 and verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So he's bound, he's shut up, and a seal is set on him. If they didn't do all this, he would get back out. This thing is devil-proof, though, and the Lord has all the keys to it. For this time, he's not going to be able to deceive the nations. So nobody will be able to use the excuse, oh, well, the devil made me do it. Well, no, the devil's bound in the bottomless pit during that future time. So he's going to be bound, but he's going to be loosed a little season. Just a little bit. Makes sense because the pleasures of sin only last for a season. And they definitely will just last a little season here because the devil's just loosed a little season. The devil's been roaming it around a while, but his evil career is going to have an end. And here his final Hoorah will come to a halt. It's only for a little season. He should have had his mind on the eternal way back before he sinned. He should have had his affection on things above, not on things on the earth. In Revelation 20 and verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ, you guessed it, a thousand years. Once again, says that phrase, a thousand years. Showing you this is a literal one thousand years. It's not being figurative. It's not just giving you an illustration it's telling you a thousand years and it says those who were beheaded for the witness of jesus talks about them you see those are your tribulation saints who died as martyrs revelation thirteen fifteen talks about how if they won't take the mark of the beast then they're going to be killed those are the ones that are beheaded for the witness of jesus and they live and reign with christ a thousand years and in verse 5 it says, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath his part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired... Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Over and over, you see the phrase, a thousand years in this chapter. The devil is let loose for the purpose of giving everyone who is in a natural body on earth, he's let loose to give them a free will choice to choose Jesus Christ or to choose the devil. You see, you have people who are even born during the millennium. They're born during this 1,000 years. And they're still going to need to make a choice. And many of the people on the planet will still choose the devil, even though he's been bound a thousand years and they've been seeing Jesus Christ sitting on a physical throne for a thousand years. They still end up choosing the devil at the end. And Revelation 20 and verse 9 says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. 
You see, it's over just as quick as the chains were loosed off the devil. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice it is where the beast and the false prophet are, showing you they are still being tormented after 1,000 years have already gone by. So it's a thousand year reign. A thousand year reign with Satan bound. A thousand year reign that ends with Satan being loosed out of the bottomless pit and being destroyed once and for all. Now, who's the king of this kingdom? Jesus Christ himself will reign as king on the earth in this kingdom for everybody to see. So he rules with a rod of iron. He will be the only good dictator you can have because he is ruling in righteousness. In Micah 4, 1 and 4, 2, it says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Imagine sitting in front of Jesus Christ as he personally teaches you the book, and you're going to have a mind like Christ in your glorified body. And in Micah 4, 3, it says, And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So with Jesus Christ as king on earth, you won't have to hear wars and rumors of wars anymore. You won't have to worry about getting drafted. You won't have to worry about any of your loved ones dying in a battle. They're going to beat their swords into plowshares. They're not going to learn war anymore. In Micah 4, 4, it says, And they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. And that's final. Nobody's going to make them afraid. No fear. Perfect peace because you have the Prince of Peace on the throne. The Lord Jesus Christ. All right, who's going to be some of the judges? In Matthew 19, 27 through 28, Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So in the millennium, not only do you have us walking around in glorified bodies, you also got the disciples sitting on thrones as judges of Israel. And you got rulers of cities. Now, if you do some suffering for the Lord, then you can reign over cities in the millennium. In 2 Timothy 2.12, it says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. In Romans 8.17, it says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be, that we may be also glorified together. See that? Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him. You won't have to worry about crime, because there's going to be a massive number of born-again saints ruling and reigning on the earth in glorified bodies that can read the minds, appear and disappear at will, go through solid objects, teleport, and so on and so forth. And when you have righteous leaders, you're going to have a huge difference in the world. Today, you're stuck choosing between the lesser of two evils. But when Jesus Christ shows up to rule and reign in righteousness and has millions of born-again believers in glorified bodies patrolling and reigning the earth, uh, King David, the twelve disciples, the, the tribulation saints who've 
been beheaded and they're sick of corruption and Old Testament saints who live for God and sheep from the nations who were good to the brethren in the tribulation. You got all these kinds of people like that. You're going to have a, a whole new world. Now let's look at the results of all this. What's the result of this new government that's ruled by righteous people and the righteous king? Well, you're going to have peace. In Isaiah 2, 4, it, sa it says, And he shall judge among the nations and rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. No more war, perfect peace. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, that's the Lord, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. That Millennial Kingdom is going to be a time of peace. And there's no peace until the Prince of Peace comes. If you know Jesus, then you'll know peace. If you don't know Jesus, then you'll have no peace. It says in Isaiah 9, 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It is the zeal of the Lord that will do it. Not me and you bring it in. It is by the Lord. It is the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. It will be so peaceful that even the animals will be at rest during this time. Isaiah eleven six. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. You know, seeing animals get ate up by their predators is sad to watch. I'm, i I seen on a video a Komodo dragon just swallow a live deer. You see alligators jumping up and grabbing, you know, baby deer. And snakes squeezing the life out of dogs and stuff. And I don't even like animals all that much. But I hate seeing that. I think PETA stands for people eating tasty animals. And I still don't like to see a, a pig get turned upside down and its throat slit by the butcher. You know, I don't like seeing stuff suffer. But when you get to the millennium, you're not going to be, nothing's going to be suffering. All that goes out the window. Isaiah 11, 7 through 9 says, And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You know, I'll finally have someone to talk to about the Bible because the earth's going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. About the only time people will really sit and listen to me talk about the Bible is you guys on here and in my Sunday school class, they're just forced to listen to me. But then people are going to care about the Word of God. They're going to want to hear it. The earth's going to be full of the knowledge of the Lord. You're not going to have any atheists. The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. It's going to be so full of the knowledge of the Lord that you won't be doing any door knocking. You won't be doing any street preaching or tracting. People are just already going to know. In Hebrews 8, 10 through 11, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Because of the fact that everyone is going to know the Lord, the only ones going around claiming to be prophets are false prophets and look what happens to them if you're going around prophesying the millennium look what happens in zechariah 13 2 through 3 it says and it shall come to pass 
in that day, what day? The day of the Lord, that 1,000 years, said the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the name of the idols out of the land. There's no more idols in that land. And they shall no more be remembered. You're not even going to remember their name. The name of the wicked shall rot. They tried to make themselves a name. It didn't work out for them. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Not only is the devil going to be in the bottomless pit, you're not going to have unclean spirit. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. So you see, capital punishment for prophesying these false prophets they get it in the neck they get thrust through and everybody's going to know the Lord so there's going to be peace and there's going to be protection in Amos 9 11 through 15 it says in that day always watch out for that phrase in that day what's that day it's the day of the Lord in that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Eden, Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed and the mountains shall drop sweet wine. And all the hills shall melt. And I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel. And they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them. Saith the Lord thy God. Nobody can pull them up out of the land again. Just like nobody can take me and you out of the Father's hand. It's perfect protection. In Isaiah 35, 1 through 2, it says, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and shall and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Peace protection and a pure language people will once again speak the same language like it was before the tower of babel in zephaniah 3 9 through 13 it says for then will i turn to the people a pure language that they may call all call upon the name of the lord to serve with one consent from beyond the rivers of ethiopia my suppliants, even the daughter of my dispersed, shall bring mine offering. In that day, what day? The day of the Lord. Shalt thou not be ashamed for all thy doings, wherein thou hast transgressed against me? For then I will take away out of the midst of thee them that rejoice in thy pride, and thou shalt no more be haughty because of my holy mountain. I will also leave in the midst of thee an afflicted and poor people, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord." The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies. Neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. No spirit of fear, no bomb threats, no mass shooters, no serial killers, no car wrecks, no suicide bombings, no sex trafficking or any of that, all speak in a pure language, perfect peace, perfect protection. Now let's look at the inhabitants of the kingdom. We've already talked about it a bit, but let's really break down who's going to be there. Well, you're going to have church-age saints and glorified bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55 talks about how me and you are going to have get glorified bodies at the rapture, and that's the bodies that we're going to go into the kingdom with. You're also going to have converted Israel that will be in the millennial kingdom. And Israel's blind in part right now. They're enemies to the gospel right now. But you're going to have a believing remnant 
and the tribulation that go into the millennium. And Romans eleven twenty six through 27, So all Israel shall be saved. As it, is writ, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And then you have tribulation saints. Men who don't take the mark of the beast, and those who come through the tribulation being good to the Lord's brethren, the Jews. In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, it talks about the judgment of the nations. The Lord's going to separate the sheep from the goats. And you're going to have a whole bunch of people that didn't take the mark of the beast. Maybe they weren't even necessarily right with the Lord, but they didn't take the mark. And he's going to separate them, the sheep from the goats, the ones that were good unto the brethren. They get to go on into the kingdom. The ones that weren't good, they're tossed into a lake of fire. It says, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. It says in Matthew 25, 46, that's the judgment of the nations. So that's tribulation. People in natural bodies that will go into the kingdom. You got tribulation saints who didn't take the mark of the beast. They're right with the Lord and didn't take the mark of the beast. They go into the kingdom in natural bodies. And then you got those who are born in the millennium. Because you're going to have people in natural bodies that go into the millennium. So then you're going to have people that's born in the millennium. Well, the church age saints will be in glorified bodies. Me and you, we're being glorified bodies and we're not going to reproduce. You're still going to have men in natural bodies who made it through from the tribulation. Jews and Gentiles, and they are going to reproduce. It says in Jeremiah 30 and verse 3, it says, For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And then in Jeremiah 30, also you go down to verse 19, it says, And out of them shall proceed thanksgiving, and the voice of them that make merry, and I will multiply them, and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Their children also shall be as aforetime, and their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. You see, he's going to multiply them. That promise to Abraham about his seed being as the sand of the sea, that goes to a whole nother level because they're going to continue to be having children in the millennium and on out through eternity. In Ezekiel 47, 21 through 22, So shall ye divide this land unto you according to the tribes of Israel, and it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot for an inheritance unto you, and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you. They shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So it said, which shall beget children among you. Now, in the millennium, old age and children in the millennium is something that you see. This also proves there's still going to be those in natural bodies. In Isaiah 65, 20, there should be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die an hundred years. A hundred years old. But the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. So it said the child shall die a hundred years. I'm showing you those old ages come back, probably be living 900 and something years old up, up and beyond that, just like they were back in the book of Genesis. In Zechariah 8, 3 through 5, Thus saith the Lord, I am returning to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, There shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. 
So you're going to have old men. You're going to have young children. There's going to be people in natural bodies. It's going to be very similar to how the world is now, but it's a safe place with righteous rule. Your kids can play in the streets and not have to worry about nobody coming and picking them up. All right, what about worship in the millennium? Well, temple worship will be restored to the, in the millennium with bloody animal sacrifices, and the sacrifices will be for national atonement for Israel, and they're going to look back to the cross. But the sacrifices won't have anything to do with the born-again sons of God who are also inhabiting the millennium. This is a national thing for Israel, not for the born-again believers in glorified bodies. In Ezekiel 45, 17, it says, And it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings and meat offerings and drink offerings in the feasts and in the new moons and in the Sabbaths and all solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering and the meat offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. And in Zechariah 14, 16 through 19, it says, And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So there you have it. They got to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. They go up to worship the king. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth into Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. If they don't come up to worship the king, they don't get rain for their crops. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, there shall be the plague, wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that came not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. See, they're going to have to to line up with the rules. And if they don't, they don't get no rain. In Isaiah 56, 6-7, Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. So you see that? Burn offerings and sacrifices on an altar. Isaiah 66, 20 through 22. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts. To my holy mountain Jerusalem, said the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord, and I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, said the Lord, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, said the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So you once again you see in offerings. You're seeing priests and the Levites. You're seeing temple worship being coming back. In Jeremiah 33, 14 through 18, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days... Notice that phrase, in those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Now that's not today. They're not righteous today. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel, neither shall the priests, the Levites, want a man before me to offer burnt offerings, and to kindle meat offerings, and to do sacrifice continually. You're going to have new moons and Sabbaths being observed. It says in Isaiah 66, 22 through 23, 
For as the new heaven and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So you got these things coming back because you got a physical Israel there. You got born again believers and glorified bodies. That's your kingdom of God. And then you got physical Israel, the Lord ruling on a physical throne. That's your kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God, the spiritual kingdom, and the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom. They merge together there on the earth in the millennium. It says in Colossians 2, 16 and 17, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. See, it's a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Those Sabbath days, that new moon is a shadow of things to come. You don't do those today, but there's somebody going to be doing them later on. And then you got punishment for not coming to Jerusalem to worship the king. As it talks about, there'll be no rain for the crops of the people that don't come to Jerusalem to worship the king. And you've got changes in nature. We already talked about how the animals will be tame during that time. You're, gonna, you're not going to have to worry about getting ate up by an animal. The animals won't be eating up each other. Another thing, the sun and moon will be brighter. In Isaiah 30, 26, it says, Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days. In the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. The waters will be healed. In Ezekiel 47 and verse 8 it says, Then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. The desert will bloom like a rose. In Isaiah 35, 1 and 2, The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy in singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Caramel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Isaiah 55, 12 through 13. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. So no more thorns, no more briars, it's going to be a time of perfect peace. You're going to have changes in leadership, changes in nature. Everything's going to be changed. It's going to change for the better because look who you got ruling and reigning. Today, the greatest man alive couldn't rule and reign perfectly. But in the millennium, you're going to have the man Christ Jesus on the throne. Nothing can get by him. He's going to have millions of born-again Christians and glorified bodies walking around. Nothing can get by them because we've got glorified bodies. We've got a mind like Christ. We're going, to, we're going to be like supermen. So it's going to be a time of perfect safety, perfect protection, perfect peace, a pure language. And you're not going to know what hits you. You're used to this old world. You're used to the good things of this present evil world. You can't even imagine the good things of that world to come. But that's a quick look at the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ.